and um, thank you for coming um, all this way on this Saturday afternoon. And um, I'd like to, this is my last talk here, so it's an opportunity for me to thank various people. I would like to begin by thanking Mrs. Um, Sin Wai Kin, who's very kindly come here this afternoon and whose husband's foundation has very generously supported my visit here to Hong Kong. I'm deeply grateful to them for the honor of receiving their support. I know how much this cause means to them and we all appreciate it very much indeed. Um, and it's a great honor that she should come to my talk this afternoon. I know that she shares my great love of the novel Hong Lo Mung, so I'm, I'm especially grateful to her for coming. And all of my friends here at the college, um, Shelby Chan, who will be coming up here later, and Gilbert Fong especially, um, from the School of Translation, I want to say how much I've enjoyed my four weeks here and how much I look forward to coming back again one day in the future. <clears throat> um, this is the last of four public lectures. I've also given two workshops, and, and I gave an initial talk to the college assembly. And um, these talks have been an extraordinary experience for me, because coming at a time when I've just retired from my own university, I have the opportunity to look back not just on my own career, but on the lives of my predecessors in, in, in Britain. And I mentioned, I've, I've talked about four different people, four great translators. And today I come to the last one, and of course, to the one who is closest to my heart, and my teacher, my collaborator, my very dear friend, and my father-in-law, um, David Hawkes. Now, before I start to talk about David, I want to summarize, I want to recap some of the main themes of my talks in this, in this month here in Hong Kong. Because the, there are themes which have linked together all of my talks and which come, these, all these themes come to a climax really today. And those themes are first of all that we need to rescue translators from what I call the abyss of theory, that deep dark hole into which they have been abandoned by translation theorists who see them simply as pieces to move around their personal chessboard. I wish to rescue them. I wish to emphasize that translators are humans in the deepest sense of the word human. They are humans. They are humain, as Foulet said to his son. They are, first of all and above all, human beings who contribute to the world of culture, the international cultural world. They can do this, and this is perhaps my main theme throughout my talks here. They have all, James Legg, Herbert Giles, Arthur Whaley, and today's subject, David Hawkes, they have all been able to do this because of their formation, the French word for a real education, a real grounding in world culture. They all four of them studied Latin and Greek. They all four of them spoke every European language. They all four of them were driven by the creative need to um, explore the imaginative world of another culture, China. So th these people, they had what the Chinese call Xiuyang. They had a true cultural education. They had foundations on which they could build. This is so important. It's something that I believe is the central theme of all my talks. And because they were four individuals who all lived in Britain, they formed a lineage. They, they, they created a tradition. And that tradition is something which I believe, finally, my fifth point, I believe we need to preserve and continue that lineage. We need to keep that tradition alive in whatever way we can. Of course, I'm trying to do that by giving these talks, but I hope to do more in the future. Um, I wish to announce today that we are forming, and um, from friends of mine and I, and some of them are here today, um, very special people, we are planning to found a new academy. And it's going to be called the Hang Seng Whitewater Academy, because this Hang Seng College has very generously and spontaneously agreed to be part of this venture. So we're putting their name into the, into the name of this academy. And the mission of this newly founded academy is to keep alive that lineage of translation, that tradition of, tu of true culture, 
of Formation of Suyang. And again, I'm announcing this for the first time today that the first symposium of the Hang Seng Whitewater Academy will be held here in Hong Kong in October of this year to celebrate the noble lineage of Hong Kong as the historical meeting place of the traditions of China and the West and to safeguard its role as the guardian of what I like to call the best China. The academy, which I, we are just forming now, will continue in the tradition of the private academies of China's past, the great Shu Yuan of Chinese history, will continue to train younger scholars and translators so that they may share with the world what the great translator James Legg, who spent so much of his life in Hong Kong, what he called the universal Chinese mind. Now, I want to begin my talk today by referring very simply to a very strong link that binds David Hawkes to Hong Kong. And that is the fact that all of his papers, of which I was the custodian, all of his letters, papers, notebooks, manuscripts, and so on, they are all in safe custody at the Chinese University Library of Hong Kong over the road in Sha Tin. And they form an archive, much of which is online, including his, his manuscript of the translation of Shi Tou Ji of Hong Kong. You can, see, you can study it online. And this is a very precious um, resource, which um, I and um, my mother-in-law, we decided to donate all of these papers to the library of the Chinese University. And I'm glad to say they are doing a wonderful job of cataloging them, of digitizing them, putting them online, and preserving them in beautiful air-conditioned conditions. Um, so this is immediately a very strong link between David, I shall refer to him in future as David because it's too complicated to keep talking about Professor Hawkes, Mr. Hawkes. I just call him David. And it's a, it forms a very strong link between David, between the memory of this remarkable man and this very place, Hong Kong, which he visited many times and where he had many special friends, some of whom I shall be talking about. Okay, we come to the main body of my talk. Now, when I talked about Arthur Whaley last week, I lamented the fact that we don't have access to his papers. So often I had to create a sort of biography or a world of Arthur Whaley by looking at his friends, because we at least know who his friends were. Now, in the case of David Hawkes, we can do better than that. We know who his friends were, but we also have access to his papers. We can read his letters from and to these friends. And so today I'm going to be mentioning quite a number of his friends and talking about them and talking about his relationship to them. I shall also be briefly talking about his life, his work, and above all, what I want to do today, if I can, is to bring to life for all of you, young and old, from wherever you, wherever you come from, to bring to life to you a most remarkable man who was my very, very close friend, my closest friend, in fact, in the world. And when he passed away in July 2009, um, I lost the person with whom I spent most time and had most conversations. So he's a very, very real person to me. And I was very, very privileged to, to know him very closely over some 40 years. And I wish to share that experience with you today because, because I believe that we need to remember that translators are human beings. And he was a very remarkable human being. Now, I realized when I, when I woke up this morning that I completely failed to explain a very important point yesterday in my workshop. I was talking about David Hawkes as a translator of Hong Meng, and I was talking about his art of recasting, of taking a Chinese text and literally melting it down to its essence and then recasting it as something new, what Chen Zhong Shu calls hua, you know, the art of transformation, and, and uh, what I call it creative recreation and recreation. Because as I emphasized yesterday, David Hawkes always enjoyed what he did. One of his great qualifications for translating Cao Xue Chen was that he was a very playful man. And the word "she" is up there as a kind of reminder of that. Um, 
And the example which I didn't explain properly yesterday, which I wish to start today's talk by explaining, is on the very first page of Hong Lo Meng. Those of you who know the novel will remember. On the very first page, it talks about this stone, you know, this shuttle, which was found, which was made into a magical stone by the goddess Nuwa. And then she only needed whatever it was, 36,500 and something. She had one stone left over, and it was left at the foot of the mountain. And the name of that mountain was Qinggeng Feng, right? Literally green, whatever you want to translate Geng as, peak, green funnel or green channel peak. And we know from the, the notes by, by Zhi and Zhai that Sai Sui was deliberately playing with words because he was, for him, the Qinggeng was also the Qinggeng, right? because, of course, in his dialect, the gung and gung sounded the same, which is a very interesting minor point. But so, so, so Zhi and Jai was playing with words. Zhi and Jai was pointing out that Cao Xuechen loved to play with words. And we know that Cao Xuechen loved to play games and all kinds of things. He liked to drink, he liked to paint rocks, and he liked to play games. And he was playing games for the entire length of his novel. The entire novel is really a game, and he's always urging the reader not to take him too seriously. Well, in this case, he was doing something remarkable. He was saying that Jia Ba Yu, the stone, was very first found at the foot of a mountain which, in fact, represents love, right? Or Qing, Qing Gan, it, that, that, that pre-human existence of the stone set in course a whole set in motion a whole human destiny that was governed by ching by feeling by passion by love this was in a sense the great obstacle standing in the way of his enlightenment it was also the great means by which he discovered enlightenment i mean the word ching is the central word of course in the whole of hong lemon because it was through ching that Jabayu discovered enlightenment. It was through his complete abandonment to feeling. He was what the English call someone who loved to be in love. He was just, he was a, a, a devotee of love. As it says in, in chapter five, his was a lust of the mind, you see. He, 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 his mind was simply a creature of love. And um, so this is, this is what's happening in the Chinese. Cao Suitin's playing with words, and he does it all the way through the novel. How on earth does a translator deal with that? And you see, David Hawkes was a, was a very, very unusual translator. He wanted to give absolute full value for money to his reader. He didn't want to cheat them of anything. And he said he would try his best to, to translate everything. He wrote that in his introduction. So when he came across this, he really thought and thought and thought, and he ended up calling the mountain Green Sickness Peak. Green Sickness Peak. And he never explained it to me, and I puzzled over it for a very long time. Why should he translate Ching Gong Fang as Green Sickness Peak? And then I did a bit of reading and research, and I came to my own conclusions, and I wrote a long essay which was published, but I didn't dare show it to him in case I was wrong. I didn't even show it to him after it was published. I just didn't dare. He was my great master, you know. And here I was explaining what he was doing, and I might have been quite wrong. And then some years later, he said to me one, one time when I was staying with him in Oxford, he said, oh, John, I just read your article. <laughs> and I was trembling, you know. Of course, you're quite right, he said. And that was the end of the conversation. We never talked about it. <laughs> So luckily I was right, because I had worked out my own, th my own explanation, which was this. If you look up green sickness in the big Oxford Dictionary, the one that weighs about half a ton, it's, it immediately sends you to Romeo and Juliet, you know, the great love tragedy of Shakespeare. And it, actually that word comes about six times in the opening scenes of Romeo and Juliet, because, you know, what does green sickness mean? It means love sickness. It means, because in, in, in the 17th century, they believed that young girls, teenage girls, when they were lovesick, they craved to eat green things, especially chalk. I mean, it was an extraordinary idea, but they did believe that if you, were, if you were a teenager and you were madly in love, you started to go white and green, and that was called kind of green sickness, right? So when, when, when Juliet's mother talks to her daughter, who's fallen in love with the most unsuitable person, 
from the other camp, you know. The, you know, the, cap, the, uh, the, the whole point of Romeo and Juliet is that it's two rival camps. And the mother, the mother is trying to talk her out of it. She's, she calls her, you green sickness carrion. Carrion means a dead bird, right? So she's, re she's, she's trying to be very rude to her daughter and to tell her to snap out of it and stop being in love with this Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou Romeo chap, you see? So she uses the word green sickness again and again and again. Now, <coughs> You see, when David chose that word, he was translating Cao Sui Chin's original Chinese on many different levels. He was playing with language. He was going deep, deep, deep underneath the text. And he was, he was giving readers a secret message, you see. And Cao Sui Chin loved secret messages, you know, what he called Zhen Wei, you know, the true flavor. And, you know, who understands my secret message, he wrote, you know. And of course, David understood his secret message. That's the whole point. And you see, I've written here that the translator, David Hawkes, is very subtly and playfully suggesting that the stone, Tongning Bao Yu, Shen Ying Shi Zhe, Jia Bao Yu, and the crimson pearl flower, the Jiang Zhu Cao, Lin Da Yu, that they are from the very beginning of the novel, like Romeo and Juliet, star crossed lovers, you see. Star crossed lovers are people who are in love, but their destiny is not to be happy, not to be happily united. They are doomed to, 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 to a tragic um, end. And, and Romeo and Juliet, of course, is the most famous example. So in one blow, David is saying this is the beginning of, of their tragic um, uh, love affair. He's also saying, and by the way, it's rather like Romeo and Juliet, in case you hadn't thought about that. And then he's also, I mean, he's doing all of this stuff but he's also got an element of the original, the Qing, you see, is green, you see. And um, I think it's the most brilliant, a brilliant example of David as a playful, scholarly, deep-thinking, um, generous-minded translator who cared above all for his reader. Above all, what David wanted to do was to give pleasure to his reader, to provide the reader of the English-speaking world with a reading experience that would send them away richer and, and happier and, and with a fuller life and also, by the way, a fuller understanding of Chinese culture. Although that wasn't his prime motive because for him, Hong Lamong was part of world culture. It was just a very great novel. So that was something I'm, I'm very sorry I completely failed to explain yesterday. It was in the handout and I think I was a little bit under the weather yesterday. Um, I think the other point that I made yesterday, which I want to bring up at the outset today, because it's one of the great qualities of David Hawkes as a translator, is this concept of, well, they're actually twin concepts. One is what, what I, I refer to several times as the art of eternal patience, which I mistakenly attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, but it's in fact Michelangelo. And that, that was their definition of genius. You know, it's just eternal patience. And, and the really great translators, whether it's Leg, Charles, Whaley, or Hawks, they have eternal patience. They're always revising and revising and revising, fine-tuning, fine-tuning. And if you look at the manuscripts, Hawks manuscripts, in the Chinese University Library, you see wonderful evidence <coughs> of the way in which he kept revising time after time. And in those days, there were no computers. So every, every revision had to be retyped on a typewriter. So it was more time consuming, but also more meaningful. And um, the third point I wanted to, to give you to start off with is also a very personal one, which is that because I was his student and became his very close friend and sat at his feet for many years, we ended up really thinking the exact same thoughts. That's why I'm standing here today, because I feel I can, you know, channel or channel um, David Hawkes's kind of inner mind. And I want to give you an example of how, how we thought exactly the same thoughts. And he himself in a letter referred to this as Zhi Yin. He said, when you go to Australia, I shall miss you very much, um, simply because of what he called the Zhi Yin thing, right? because we, we, we knew each other's minds. And there was one occasion when he came to Australia in 1979, and he said one morning, shall we sit down and have a look at your translation? Because he never interfered with my translation. But on that occasion, I said, okay, 
So we went to my little office and we sat down and we looked at the first page of one chapter, I can't remember, chapter 85, I think. And he, he took out his pencil and he started to make corrections to my translation. Went on all morning, about three hours. No, this is not quite right. No, I think this is the better. <clears throat> I think we should move this here and so on. <clears throat> so it was like a kind of master class for me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> And I was really quite nervous because, you know, there I was having my work corrected, you see. And we went on for three hours and then finally we got to the end and he said, I think that's right, about right now. And I stared at the page and I said to him, David, that's exactly what I wrote in the first place. He had actually gone round about and come back to the exact words I had chosen in the very first place because basically I'd learnt everything from him and I'd, I, I'd reached all the same conclusions that he did, but he hadn't realized that in the course of correcting it, he thought he was improving it and improving it and improving it. But by the end of the morning, we'd come back to the very beginning and he, he, he ticked off on my original draft without even knowing that it was. So it was an extraordinary experience of precisely the, the, what, what, what we call the quality of Zhiyin, but also the relentless dedication to revision and revision and revision. And if I'm sent a translation to assess or whatever, to review, I can tell within one page whether the translator has really put in enough time revising and revising and revising, whether they have the eternal patience required of translation. And you see, David was the absolute example of that. He was single-minded. That was the word used about James Legg. He was single-minded. And so was David, in a very different kind of way. Okay. And there we are, sitting together, you see, having a cup of tea. And this was in the last year of his life, in 2009. And um, my wife and I took him on a holiday. We didn't know he was going to die three weeks later. Um, but um, there we are, having tea in a garden in Sussex that um, belonged to Vita Sackville West, Sissinghurst. And, um, we, I think I must have spent uh, several thousand hours sitting and talking, or mostly listening, actually, um, to David. And uh, our minds were very, very finely attuned, and they still are. Okay. <coughs> since, since I'm so preoccupied with the idea of lineage, I thought it would be best to start with a photograph of David's ancestors. Um, and uh, there they are. He came from a very interesting family background because basically, if you go far, if you go just two generations back, his parent, his grandparents, were um, self-made men. Self-made. They were they were laundry. They ran a laundry business in East London, and then it got bigger and bigger, and they had branches. And then his grandfather, who's somewhere in this picture, is became one of the um, laundrymen's representative on the East London Borough Council. So they were what you'd call humble people. And David never forgot that. He always referred to himself as, as belonging to the working class. And um, later, I married his daughter, as some of you know. And his daughter was very fiercely, she was very proud of being what she called working class. Actually, she wasn't remotely working class. But I mean, there was a kind of inverted snobbery there, you see. and. Um, but David still had very strong working class roots, and they stayed with him all his life. I shall talk a bit later about his politics. He was what they call old labor in England. His, his kind of politician was someone like Michael Foote, and he hated, um, oh my goodness, I'm having a terrible blank now. What was that new labor prime minister who took Britain into Iraq? Um, Tony Blair, yes. You couldn't mention Tony Blair in David's presence because he thought Tony Blair had betrayed the Labour tradition. He was a true old Labour supporter. This is David as a young boy at a school. And I remember asking him, why are you smiling? He wasn't a very smiley kind of person. I said, why are you smiling in this picture? And he said, oh, because the day before, a boy punched me in the face and broke one of my teeth. So I had to keep my mouth closed, and I thought I'd keep my mouth closed and have an enigmatic smile. So that's David as a boy. And you can see from, the, from that picture, he was a very good-looking person. He was, he was a beautiful person. He was beautiful in death. I visited him um, after his death when he was laid out 
in the chapel of rest. He was wearing a kind of white robe, an, an embroidered white robe. And he looked like an Old Testament prophet with a long white beard. And he was, even in his old age, he was a very, a very beautiful man. Um, and there, there he is with all his siblings. He only had one sister. That's his mother on the left. He had uh, all, all the rest. He had brothers. He had one, two, three, four, five brothers. Anyway, he went, he was, he was allowed, he was enabled to go to the local grammar school, which is the state school, and because of, because of the fact that he was very, very clever, he was singled out immediately by the teachers to study Latin, and he even did a bit of Greek. He told me he sat in the back row of the Latin class and started his study of Greek. And then, at the age of about 17, he won a scholarship, an open scholarship, to Christ Church College, Oxford. Now, those of you who know Oxford will realize that Christ Church is the, the aristocratic college. It's where all the nobility go. So very probably, he was, you know, having a room next door to the Viscount so-and-so and the Duke of something or other, and he said that he, was the, he thought he was the only working class boy in the whole college. And, um, but of course, Christ Church College, as well as being somewhat aristocratic, it's also a very beautiful college, and I think that listening to him talk for many years about Oxford, I think his love-hate relationship with Oxford began here, because you know he, he spent many years at Oxford, and he died in Oxford, and, and yet there were things about Oxford that he could never tolerate. Later, so he, went, he first went to Oxford in the early, very early years of the war, and then after completing his his classical um, honor mods, he was drafted to go and work in the British intelligence effort. He had a weak lung, so he wasn't able to go and fight in the war. So like so many clever people from Oxford and Cambridge, he was part of that community that was trying to decode um, Japanese and German, but he was especially, he was made to learn Japanese. He did a crash course in Japanese, and then he taught, he taught these I'm sure you've seen that movie Enigma. He taught the code breakers Japanese. That's how he got started in Asian languages, you know. It wasn't through some great love of literature or anything. He, um, he just um, ended up learning Japanese for the war effort. And so did many other people, you know. A lot of leading American sinologists began in the war wor working uh, as um, language experts for the intelligence military intelligence, and that's what David did. He wasn't actually at Bletchley Park. He was in Bedford. It was a connected establishment. So that was the, his beginning in Asian studies. And um, then he went back to Oxford after the war, and they didn't do Japanese at that point. Otherwise, he might have done Japanese. He went, instead, he went, to do, he went and did Chinese, and the only person teaching it at that time was somebody called E.R. Hughes, who was a retired missionary. And after completing his degree at Oxford, David, without really making too many preparations, got on a boat to go to what was then called Beijing, you know, Peking, under, uh, uh, after the war, because the capital was still at that time in Nanjing. And um, this is one of the earliest photographs from his Peking days. Now, I cannot stress enough the importance of the three years that David spent in Peking. And when we, when we go back to this idea of formation, of, of the true development of somebody's personal culture, their Suyang, his three years in Peking were absolutely formative. And he often spoke of them in that way. And the first two pictures just show him as obviously a very good looking, he looks a bit like James Dean, I think. Um, his young, the young David Hawkes in, in Peking when he first arrived in 1948. And when you see the next picture, you'll see he also smoked a cigarette every now and then. He's got one hanging rather languidly from his mouth. And, you know, you can see he was a, a very nice looking young man. And um, when he first arrived in Peking, not only was he immediately I immersed in the wonderful culture of old Peking, um, I've just, I just thought I would be indulgent and show you one or two beautiful photographs of old Peking by Hedda Morrison.
who, who was the fine photographer married to Alastair Morrison, the son of G.E. Morrison of Peking. And she took photograph after photograph. She was a German photographer, a fine photographer. I just selected five of her photographs. This was the Peking that David went to, you see. And, um, oh, six, sorry. Now, I'm going to try and give you some idea of the importance of Peking in David's life by jumping to the year 2007, when David and Jean, his wife, came to visit us in, in Australia, in Canberra. And we were having dinner with a very nice friend and neighbor by the name of Dai Ching. There she is. She's an extremely lively person. I think she's too famous for me to have to introduce her. She's an environmental activist and a, a, a very fine lady. Um, she was having dinner with us. And David started talking about Peking, his memories of Peking. And he started to sing the street songs that he remembered, the street sellers, the vendors, and the children's songs. But he, he always remembered the first line, and then he couldn't remember the rest. And then extraordinary thing happened. I wish I'd had a video camera, because Dai Ching, who also grew up in Peking, but was younger, she would then finish the whole song. This went on for about half an hour while they sang songs from old Peking. And for them, these were treasured memories. And, um, and they, between them, they managed to complete several songs. It was a wonderful experience. And um, this is him with his wife, Jean. His wife, Jean, is still alive. I shall be visiting her in England in a few weeks. She's now 89. And um, you see, they'd only met four times in, uh, in Oxford, and they corresponded at great length. They courted each other by, by letter. It's a wonderful thing to do. And she still has all his letters by her bedside. And um, you know, she sometimes rereads them, and, and she has her letters to him because he kept those. What a wonderful thing, you see. Nowadays, it'll all be emails and stuff, or, t or tweets. I mean, I don't know what people do nowadays, but you know, they presumably court each other by tweeting or something. Um, but anyway, I think Jean, being an extremely um, brave, resourceful young woman, and very beautiful, just decided I can't, well, I'm, I'm thinking for her now. She probably wouldn't have ever said this. She said, I better get to Peking now before he falls into the hands of some young Chinese lady, you see. So, so off she got, she got on a boat, she took the slow boat to China, and um, she turned up, and, um, and they got married in China. And, you know, they had a very long and happy marriage. And she, she um, <laughs> yes, she was a wonderful, um, person, well, they're both wonderful people, but there they are, you see, in Peking, um, against that famous, um, nine, is it Nine Dragons? I can't remember, it's a famous wall. And, um, and uh, that, that was in 1950, and in 1951, they returned to England. Now, when, they were, when, when David first arrived in Peking, the other great formative experience, which really changed his life, was that he lived with, initially he lived with the poet William Empson and his wife. They had a large house, an old, an old in, in, in one of the old parts of Inner Peking. And Hetta Empson, who was an artist, um, impulsively just invited David to come and live with them. It was a bit of a sort of artistic commune, really. And David, he, he, he found himself for the first time in his life living with a kind of bohemian household who only believed in art and free love and all those kind of things. And when I was talking about the Bloomsbury Circle, it was a bit like a peaking branch of the Bloomsbury Circle. And um, I'm afraid that's a late, a late photograph of William. He had a, a large beard when he was young, but it wasn't at all like that. And this is David with Hetta and William. Empson in Peking. They had a huge influence on him, both of them, in turning him into a, what I would call a creative artist translator. That's just the, the Empson family having a picnic. I don't think David's in that picture, unless that's him there, I'm not sure. How do I get this thing to work? I don't think that's David, but that's certainly, um, that's Hetta, 
and that's the children, Jake and Mogador, and that's William. I'm not sure who these people are. I shall try to ask Jean. And this wonderful photograph is of their wedding in um, Peking, the, the, the reception held afterwards at the British legation. And um, it is an extraordinary photograph. There's William Empson. His beard wasn't really that big. It's a, it's a, it's a hole in the photograph, actually. <laughs> it looks like an enormous beard, but, but he's certainly a funny-looking man. There's Jean looking absolutely beautiful. David beautifully dressed in that, probably a new suit. Um, this man here was William Empson's great friend, I.A. Richards, who was the great Cambridge critic. And I could go through all of these people one by one. They're all interesting people. Um, that's Pamela Yude, who well, she became Pamela Yude, later married the person who was the governor of Hong Kong. And this is um, Adele Ricketts, who translated Wang Guo-wei's Ren Jian Si Hua. So it was an extraordinary community of people. Um, that is Robert Ruhlmann, who was a French sinologist. That's the Bishop of Peking. And somewhere there is the Norwegian consul. Anyway, you know, it was this extraordinary gathering uh, at that time. It was a moment in time when um, David and Jean got married. They were the first foreigners to be married in Peking after the communists established the new wedding marriage regulations. And amongst their circle of friends with um, the Amsons, which was a very large circle of interesting people, was a young man called David Kidd, who, um, who married a Chinese lady and wrote a wonderful book later on about, it was a marriage of convenience, that's what we call it nowadays, but later he wrote a wonderful book called Peking Story. He went to live in Japan, and he, he was um, a very, in, in, in the Empson Peking days, he was a very, very elegant, very um, rather flamboyant <laughs> young, young, young man in that circle. Now, when, when David went to Beida as a Yen Sheng, as a graduate student, the Xiaojiang, the head of Beida, was Hu Shi. And David had written several letters to Hu Shi, none of which even got opened, because apparently Hu Shi was famous for not opening his mail. And um, the only foreigner who had access to Hu Shi's office was William Emson. In fact, he was the leading foreign teacher at Beida at the time. And one day, William Emson went into Hu Shi's office and said, oh, you've got a whole pile of unopened letters from England. What are they all about? And it was because he prompted him that Hu Shi opened the letters and discovered that David Hawkes was coming to Beida. Actually, David Hawkes was already on his way, so it didn't really make any difference. But when, when David got there, he enrolled in a lot of different classes. And you see, it's almost like most of these teachers I'm going to show you are like living legends, you know. One of his teachers was Yu Ping Bo, you see. He went to Yu Ping Bo's lectures and he wrote in his diary, I can't understand a word he says because his Zhejiang accent is so strong, you know. And nowadays we read Yu Ping Bo's books and we think that he was speaking in, you know, Beijing Hua, but actually his lectures were delivered in a very, very heavy Zhejiang accent. And, but David, but David, without realizing it at the time, was sitting at the feet of one of the great Hong Lamang scholars, you see. Another of his teachers was a man named Luo Changpei, who was especially into, into linguistics and early etymology and things like that. He was a Manchu, he was a Qian. And this, and this, this is a very early photograph of Lin Gang, another, another of David's teachers, and Tang Lang. These were all in the Chinese department, the Zhong Wen Xi, you see. But when I once asked David, which person influenced you most in all of your life, I asked him that question during an interview. And I really expected him to say, Arthur Wayne. And to my enormous surprise, he said, oh, the person I always admired the most and who influenced me the most was Wen Yi Duo. Of course, Wen Yi Duo died before um, David arrived. But why did he admire him so much? I've tried to indicate that in the caption, because Wen Yi Duo combined the qualities of being a scholar and being a poet. And I think these qualities are qualities that David himself wished to emulate, you know. He was a, he was a creative scholar, a poet scholar. He was a, um, 
And Wen Yudou was not just a lightweight scholar, he was a very serious scholar. His studies of the Yi Jing, of the Shi Jing, of the Chu Tzu, especially the Chu Tzu, these were very, very important scholarly studies. But he was also at heart, he was a poet, he was a creative artist. So you see David mentioned Wen Yudou as his great model. That's very interesting to me. Now when David went back from Peking, he went back to Oxford to complete his PhD. His PhD, his Bo Shi Lunwen, was actually on the Chu Tzu. The Chu Tzu, it's quite a, a scholarly work. Later on, he published a translation of the Chu Tzu, which he called the Songs of the South. But his PhD was a more or less a kind of textual study. Very, very detailed, very serious, and um, never published. So he was capable of doing what I would call very hard hardcore scholarship. And for that reason, he actually frightened people. I mean, other scholars were almost in awe of him because he had such a command of the old scholarship, the real scholarship, you know. He could hold his own with anybody on, on, on a purely scholarly basis. But you see, he didn't really regard scholarship with great awe himself. For him, it was just a means to an end. It was a means towards literature. For him, literature was the ultimate the absolute ultimate. Now these are the colleagues he found himself with in Oxford in the 50s. And in the middle there is, is Homer Dubbs, who was the professor for a few years in the 50s. He was an American missionary. They, you know, in, at Oxford they had a very, a very unfortunate history because they tried to, uh, they appointed a professor at Oxford just before the war a really great scholar called Chen Ying Ke. He was at Lingnan Dao at the time, sometimes pronounced Chen Ying Che, right? And um, he actually accepted the appointment. But um, he, he became virtually blind, and he was unable to take up the appointment. They kept the, the chair vacant for something like seven years, and it would have been the first time a seriously eminent Chinese scholar had been appointed to a chair in Europe, but unfortunately he was unable to come. And then they offered the chair to a very great Dutch sinologist called Doivendach. And Doivendach <laughs> thought about it for a long while and decided to stay in Holland because he was Dutch. And I think Leiden increased his salary anyway. So, <laughs> um, so then they, they, they had to resort to employing a retired missionary and they employed Homer Dubs. Ah, uh, what am I doing? Sorry, pressing the wrong button. Yes, so there's, it's very clumsy, this. There's Homer Dubs. Now, this gentleman here was another, a very important figure in David's life. His name is Wu Shichang, and he was, at this stage, still a, a young lecturer at Oxford. And he was, he was very eminent in China. He was a friend of Guo Moro, for example, a friend of Chen Zhongshu. He was one of that generation of scholars who um, somehow managed to be traditionally trained in the old scholarship, but also to be moving into the modern age. He was very knowledgeable about um, Zhao Guan, very knowledgeable about Song Tzu, and um, a, a very, very wide, very widely learned scholar. And um, of course, he was also a, a, one of the great experts on Hong Lo Meng. So David learned a great deal from, from Wu Shishang about Hong Lo Meng. And uh, in 1958, Wu Shishang published a very, very serious study of Hong Lo Meng in English at the Oxford University Press. Now, in use, using, interestingly enough, the very font, the very Chinese type that James Legg had brought with him in the 1880s. So there's a lineage for you. Wu Shichang, when he published his book on the Red Chamber Dream in English with a lot of Chinese characters, he used James Legg's actual physical type for his book. Nowadays, it's all done by computers, of course. And there's the young David, you see? He's back from Peking. He's trying to dress like a serious young Oxford scholar. But he was never very convincing, I'm afraid, as a serious Oxford scholar. You see, that's what you're supposed to look like if you're a serious Oxford don, eh? <laughs> And that was the aspect of Oxford that David simply hated. 
you know, he just hated the whole concept of being an Oxford Don, you know. And um, you've only got to take one look at that photograph to understand why, you know. Um, he hated the sort of the very heavy establishment attitude of all the colleges, you know. And um, he, he was always in conflict with that side of the university. When, now eventually, a few years later, he was elected to the chair of Chinese at Oxford. And here again, the lineage shows through because although Arthur Whaley held no uh, academic appointment, he was always consulted about every appointment. So the, the selectors at Oxford would have got in touch with Arthur Whaley and said, who do you recommend? And of course, he recommended David Hawkes because already in the mid-50s, they were very good friends. And they were both interested in Shu Tzu. And um, so David was immediately to Arthur Whaley's nomination. And of course, that meant that David got the chair. Now that meant that Wu Shichang didn't get the chair. And Wu Shichang, I don't think, was very happy about that. And because he was a very fine scholar, and he thought he was being discriminated against because he was Chinese. Actually, it wasn't the case at all. He would have been a hopeless professor of Chinese. He was completely um, scatterbrained, and he would have been useless at committees and all that sort of red tape, you know, all that dreadful stuff. And anyway, he was very fed up, so he decided to become suddenly very patriotic and go back to China. Okay, well, poor man, he got back to China in the mid-60s eventually, and then just in time for the Cultural Revolution. And it's, uh, I don't go into the details of his subsequent life, but one of his children ended up in a mental asylum, and I, I got to know him very well later on in Peking. Very tragic that he should have gone back at that time, but that was the end of Wu Shichang in Oxford. Now. I want to illustrate David's attitude towards the university in a way which will perhaps be rather shocking to some of you. Um, when I was a student at Oxford, when I was an undergraduate studying Chinese with, with David, he, was, he taught me um, Hong Lemeng, and he also taught me Yuan Zhaju, Yuan Plays. I was a single student, one student, one teacher, and I was so lucky. But we had about four people that year studying Chinese, four, a total of four. And one of them was a very nice young man called Shiva Naipaul, whose brother was very famous, V.S. Naipaul, was a very famous novelist and uh, essayist. And Shiva was his younger brother, charming man. Um, and he was just writing his first novel called Fireflies during his last year of, of Chinese. And in those days, I think it's still the case, to do your final exams, you have to sit 13 examinations, 13 three-hour examinations. It went on for a fortnight, and it was grueling. And poor old Shiva, he sat next to me in the hall. He was just suffering terribly, because he was writing a novel, he hadn't done any revision, and he couldn't know what to write. And I shall never forget, we had a paper, we shared a subject, Shiva and I, a special subject called the Tao Te Ching, which I'm now translating, actually. And Shiva, we both had to write an exam on the Tao Te Ching. Questions like, you know, what is the nature of the Tao as blah, blah, that kind of academic nonsense. And Shiva sat there staring at the paper, and he couldn't think of a single word to write. He was just, and eventually he, his head collapsed onto the desk. And he was right next to me, and I felt quite sorry for him, but I wasn't allowed to talk to him because it was an examination. And he couldn't think of a single word to write about the Tao Te Ching. Now, of course, if a true Taoist was examining it and he received a blank page, he would give it A plus because, <laughs> well, because Tao Ke Tao Fei Chan Tao, you can't say anything about it. Mei Shen Ke Shuo Da, just a Tao. But unfortunately, in Oxford, you know, we don't have Taoists examining us. However, the invigilator of that particular exam was David Hawkes. And he was sitting up there. He was a good friend of Shiva's. They used to go drinking together. And he, and he kept looking at Shiva and looking worried. And then he'd come down to me and say, what's the matter with Shiva? And I said, I don't know, David. He can't. And then eventually, he came up to Shiva and said, Shiva, you've got to write something. If you don't write something, I can't even give you B minus. You know? <laughs> this is in front of about 500 people, right? And Shiva just said, I can't, David. I, said, I can't think about it. 
So David went back on up onto his, onto his platform and sat down there for a few minutes. And then he came down and he, took, he put his hand on Shiva's shoulder and said, come on, we're going for a drink. And he walked out of the examination hall, leaving it completely uninvigilated, <laughs> breaking almost every rule in the university book, and took Shiva off for a few whiskeys around the corner at the nearby pub. They, read, they returned about 20 minutes later, and Shiva had been given lots of dao, you see. He'd been given <laughs> lots of <laughs> So he managed to write at least something, and he passed. He got a very low grade, but he managed to get a degree, and therefore managed to get a job. Unfortunately, he died very young. And, um, but that was, I, I give you that story simply because it illustrates David complete disrespect for the university system. He never respected it. He always was uncomfortable with the sort of stuffy Oxford academics. And as, as I'll tell you later, he eventually resigned his chair because of that, because he wanted to translate Hong Lao Meng. And for him, that was his true vocation. And that was, that was what he'd been preparing for all his life, ever since he was a young man in Peking. He first learnt to speak Chinese by reading Hong Lao Meng with an old Manchu um, retired civil servant in the Emson's courtyard. And he said it was a mad way to learn modern Chinese, but when he arrived in Peking, all he could speak was like pre Qin dynasty, you know, um, ancient Chinese. So he'd go around saying, ar hu, ar ye, you know, kind of stuff. And I mean, he didn't know a word of modern Chinese at all. So he learnt, he very first encountered Hong Lao Meng in Peking in 1948. And um, he continued to be fascinated by the novel and to, and to read it and again and again. And um, oh, this is Arthur Whaley, yes, this is his great friend and mentor. Throughout these years, um, David and Arthur Whaley were very, very close. Arthur Whaley was asked to translate Hong Lo Meng by his publisher, but he said, no, I can't. I've just finished one long novel. That was the tale of Genji in the Yuan Shi Wu Yu. I don't want to do a second long novel, I'm sorry. So he never translated Hong Lo Meng. I'm glad because otherwise David would never have done it himself. Now, during the 50s when David was at Oxford and he ended up as the professor, um, he almost went to Australia. I mean, sometimes it's interesting to look at the things that didn't happen, you know. And he, he applied for the professorship of Chinese at Sydney University which is at that time the leading center for Chinese studies. And then he discovered that another person had applied called A.R. Davis, who was also one of Arthur Whaley's young men. And being a gentleman, he withdrew because you didn't compete with other gentlemen. And um, so he never went to, we never went to Australia, but instead A.R. Davis did. And if David had gone to Australia, I think he would have been a much happier man. Why? Because. As I'll say later, David was a profoundly melancholic and really very depressed individual. And I think Australia, being a very open and sunny country, is quite helpful for people who suffer from that kind of temperamental shortcoming. I think he would have been a happier man in Australia. He always loved visiting Australia. And I remember once driving with him across the Australian landscape, and he said to me, how much he liked Australia. And he just said he was so deeply affected by what he called the silence of Australia. Now, by that, he didn't mean that it was silent. He didn't mean that there was nothing in there. He meant, and he explained it, he meant Australia is so silent because the white settlers in Australia have cut themselves off so profoundly from the indigenous culture of Australia. In that respect, it's very different from New Zealand, you see. Australia has, is in complete denial, I mean, white Australia is in complete denial of its Aboriginal heritage. And David referred to that as the great silence, because there is no resonance in the white civilization, so-called, of Australia, does not resonate with its own indigenous, extraordinary Aboriginal heritage. And I, I just mention that because I think it, everything that I say, I hope, will contribute to conjuring up in your minds this extraordinary person and the way he lived and the way he was. He was also a very political being and um, actively involved in um, 
political issues. And as I mentioned earlier, he was a great admirer of Michael Foote, who was old labor. You know, old labor is the traditional, um, uh, the, the traditional or the traditional socialist um, tendency of the Labour Party, which has been pretty much abandoned, except for this wonderful new man, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who's suddenly arrived out of nowhere, taking everybody by surprise. But I can't imagine he'll succeed in becoming elected Prime Minister. But David was a very staunch supporter of old Labour. And he was also a great believer in what he called social credit, which was a, a big philosophy back in the 20s and 30s, based on the idea that we, we mustn't let the banks control our lives by making us constantly in debt, you know, because we live in debt. Our children grow up in debt. We, you know, I mean, I'm, I have to say, having retired from the university, one of, one of the things that makes me happiest of all is that I've been able to suddenly be debt-free, you know, I don't have any debts. It's an amazingly liberating experience. And I look around me and I realize that, especially the people of my children's age, they come out of university having accumulated huge debts, you know, and then the banks can control them for the rest of their lives, you know, and then they get mortgages and they become even more indebted. And you see, David was very, very against that. He gave me a book once called Mortgage, The Grip of Death, Mortgage, because actually well, that's what it means in French. And he was, a, he was profoundly against the banking system as such. Not because he was anti-Jewish or anything, but because he thought it enslaved people. And he's dead right. And he, he was always going off, even up into his 80s, he'd go off on, on protest marches, usually uh, against the war in Iraq. He was very, very excited about that. And very, very committed to the Palestinian cause as well. Sitting with David, watching the news on the television was a really difficult experience because he would start screaming and shouting and, and, and hurling abuse at the, at the television because, because of what was happening in Gaza or wherever it was. He was a, a fierce opponent of Israel. He was also a great believer in another traditional labor movement in the UK, the cooperative movement. So everything he did, he preferred to have a bank. He, he banked with the cooperative bank. He shopped at the cooperative supermarket. And even when he, when he was preparing for his death, he paid for all his funeral expenses through the cooperative funeral organization. So when I went to see him lying, lying in the chapel, it was the cooperative funeral director's chapel. He was a great believer in that. He was a great believer in the United Nations. You know, these are all the things that, you know, were so important to his generation, which are so so rapidly being thrown away, unfortunately. And you know, David's personal career came to an end in 1971 when he resigned from the Oxford professorship and suddenly found himself without a job, without a penny, because there was no grant. He wasn't being given a huge grant by the Jiang War Foundation or something, nothing. No, he and I just did it, as he said, for the hell of it, you know, and that meant there was no money at all. And suddenly, he had no income, and he applied for a job with the post office sorting letters, and they said, you're too highly qualified. <laughs> He applied for a job as a milkman delivering milk bottles, and they said, you're too highly qualified. So there he was without a job. And I think at that point, I'm going to pause for five minutes to keep you in suspense as to what happened next. Um, so we'll have a five-minute break. Very well, let's continue then. Um, I left you with a picture of David Hawkes, without a job, penniless, and um, with, no, with no real prospect of being able to support himself. And can you imagine doing that? Can any of you here imagine throwing up what was the, the top job in Oxford Sinology, in, in London, in British Sinology, without really having made particularly good plans for the future, and suddenly finding yourself, um, you know, in trouble. And I was at the time, I had just, this was in 1971, I had just um, signed up with him in 1970 to translate the Hong Lomong together. And of course, I, I, for me, it was no big deal because I didn't have a job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't have to give anything up at all. I was unemployed and penniless and a single parent with two children. He had four children and, um, and a wife and no income. 
and I, I remember I remember at the time thinking how incredibly brave he was. And he was. I mean, some would say reckless, but I think he was just brave and single-minded. He knew he couldn't combine translating such a great work as Hong with being a so-called serious academic and going to meetings and all that stuff. Um, now, it could have ended badly, but it didn't because of this man. This man is called John Sparrow. He's no longer alive. He's been, he's been gone many years. But he was a very remarkable character from what I call the old Oxford. And old Oxford, old labor, formation, Julian, they're all part of the same thing, right? I mean, I'm starting to sound like a record, you know, repeating the same thing again and again and again. But I have to, because it's so important. Now, John Sparrow was a lawyer. He was a barrister, a QC. But he was trained in the classics. And he wrote, you know, he wrote poetry in Latin, and he published it in Latin. He wrote epigrams, Latin epigrams, beautiful things. And you see, we all, John Sparrow, David, myself, James Legg, Giles, Whaley, we all had to learn to write Latin and Greek poetry as schoolboys. I mean, you could say it's absurd, but I mean, it's just, it's no more absurd than the hundreds of years in which Chinese Wenren began their careers by writing Bagu Wenren. They wrote eight-legged essays, you know? Now, you will immediately be able to laugh at me because I have always argued that they should bring back the Bagu Wenjiang, you know, because it gives you a structure, you see. And, and I mean, it was thrown away with all the rest, you see, in the so-called, the wonderful so-called May the Fourth Movement. And classical Chinese, the Bagu And, you know, the only people, well, no, some of the most outstanding people who opposed the May the Fourth Movement were, of course, translators. People like Lin Shu, Yen, Yen Fu. Why? Because they were great translators who knew the value of their xiu yang, you see. And they could see that it was all being thrown away. And, you know, I used to really enjoy provoking my students from mainland China, because I used to say to them, your, your essays are just hopelessly unstructured, you know. You're just using Microsoft Word, so why not use, why don't you all go away and learn how to write a good eight-legged essay of Ba Gu Wen, you know. And they thought I was completely insane, you know. But I mean, I actually think more and more that I was right, and that Lin Shu was right, you know. And that, and that we can't afford to throw away all this, this legacy from the past. And you see, my daughter went to school in France. She completed her secondary school in, in France. And in France, they teach secondary students to write essays in a very structured way. The beginning, the development, the middle section, it's just like a Bagu went. And then in the second middle, in the middle section, you're supposed to introduce quotations from Voltaire or Moliere or, you know, um, Descartes. And you have to use your special moment to put in your quotation. And then you have your development and then you have your conclusion. So my daughter, who became very fluent in French, she was topping her class in French, in a French lycée. Um, she went to university at o in, in, in England, to the University of Sussex, and she discovered that all of her contemporaries had real trouble writing essays because they had no idea of the structure of an essay, that they'd been brought up on communicational English, you know, communicative English, where you just blather on, you know, about anything around, and you don't have a structure, you don't have an opening or a development or a conclusion, or even a theme, you just sort of, you know, you wing it. And um, she discovered that she was at a huge advantage over them because she had this real French formation. She knew how to write an essay. And she knew how to think because they also taught philosophy very seriously in French lycées. And, the, and the basically, the curriculum hadn't changed probably for 100 years. And every school did the same thing at exactly the same moment in the week. So on a Friday morning, everybody would be doing philosophy. They would all be reading Descartes. So it was a very traditional system, and I, I saw the benefits of it. Now, anyway, that's John Sparrow. He was a very traditionally trained lawyer who then became the head of what is probably the greatest college at Oxford, because it's a true academy. And um, I think I got a photograph. Yes. All Souls College, I like to surprise myself with photographs. I can never remember which order they're in. All Souls College um, 
is one of the wealthiest colleges at Oxford. It's also one of the most traditional. And it all, always used to elect fellows by word of mouth, really. They'd be sitting around the high table, passing the port, and talking about, oh, have you heard of so-and-so? He's looking for a fellowship. Oh, I think that's a jolly good idea. Let's invite him, you know, like a gentleman's club, you know. They were nearly all men, I have hate to say. And, but you see, John Sparrow got to hear of David's situation. Someone probably said to him, oh, there's this wonderful professor of Chinese. He just threw up his job. He's translating this huge novel called The Dream of the Red Chamber. He, he desperately needs help. So within a matter of days, John Sparrow got in touch with David. And um, John Sparrow, who I knew personally, got in touch with David and said to him, would you like to be a fellow of all souls? And more or less the next day, it was decided that David would become a research fellow of all souls for seven years to enable him to complete the translation. And when that seven years came to an end, he was elected to another seven years. So for 14 years, he was a fellow of all souls. And his only duty was to have dinner once a month. He had to go, he had to go in once a month to eat a meal. And uh, he found that quite, a, quite an ordeal, actually, because he, d he didn't enjoy all of that ceremony and nonsense. But, you know, it wasn't too bad, really. That's all you have to do. And, and, you know, this kind of place, it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, even All Souls has changed now. For a start, they take in women. And um, <laughs> in the second place, you have to do some teaching. You know, in the modern world, places like this, and, and I have to say, when I was a student, I was also quite political. And we discovered that All Souls was rich because it had a lot of money invested in South African gold mines, right? And that was the days of the anti-apartheid movement. So we'd go outside St. All Souls College waving placards saying, you know, um, you're living off the sweat of the black population of South Africa. And it was true. So I'm not, you know, there's always a dark side to tradition. I know that. But there's also a good side. And in this case, the good side saved the Hung Amung from never being translated. Now, throughout David's time at Oxford, he, like Arthur Whaley, he acquired a very wide circle of friends. And I think that, as in the case of Arthur Whaley, one can, one can learn quite a lot about people by discovering who their friends are. I think everybody, I think that's true of everybody. And two of his closest friends, um, in fact, they were friends of both David and Jean's, were Iris Murdoch, the great novelist, and her husband, John Bailey, who was one of the leading literary critics at Oxford. I like his books very much. He wrote a lot about Russian literature, too. And they were a great couple. They were a famous couple at Oxford. You know, somebody wrote a movie about Iris called Iris with Kate Winslet and Judy Dench, and because she later got Alzheimer's. And um, they were a famous couple. She taught philosophy at St. Anne's College. She was the only person in Oxford, the whole of Oxford, to teach existentialism, because most of Oxford was busy f exploring the meaning of meaning. You know, they had the great thing about Oxford philosophy. It wasn't to do with what the, what the Europeans call philosophy. It's to do with how to use words. You know, I found it most annoying. But she was the exception. She taught Jean-Paul Sartre and uh, you know, Heidegger and the whole European tradition of philosophy. And they were very good friends of David and James. Um, you can also learn quite a lot about people from, from their activities, from what they actually you know, do for fun. And David was a very keen gardener. He was very proud of his ability to grow splendid vegetables and plant fruit trees. And wherever he went, every time he had a new house, he would develop a wonderful garden. And I often helped him. And in, Ox in Oxford, he had what's called an allotment, which is a piece of public land where you go and plant your vegetables. And then he liked that as well because it was very sort of um, communal. It fitted in with his old labor idea. And he'd go down there and chat to the locals over his potatoes kind of thing. He also used to go down to his allotment to try and work out rhymes in his translation, because he found that often he'd be sitting in his study translating a Chinese poem, and he couldn't get the rhyme. So instead of sitting there getting more and more of a headache, he'd get up, 
get hold of his spade and his fork, walk down to the allotment and just get a breath of fresh air. And more often than not, he'd come home and he would solve the problem of the rhyme. So gardening was, gardening was part of his life, a very important part of his life. After a number of years, um, by which time he'd almost finished the Hong Lao Meng translation, which was mostly done in Oxford, he decided to retire to the Welsh hills, to a very, very beautiful part of Wales. Wales, you know, is very mountainous, very green, and for the most part, very poor. And you can go there and, uh, for rather little money, or you used to be able to go there for rather little money and buy a house. And, and um, he and Jean were looking for a place in Wales to retire to, and they saw an advertisement for a farmhouse it said, would suit eccentric academic. <laughs> so they immediately thought, that must be for us. And they went to look at it, and they bought it for very little. And they spent about 10 years there repairing it and um, growing vegetables and leading a very, very simple and very idyllic life. When he was in Wales, he decided, that's enough. I'm not going to do any more Chinese. I've had enough Chinese. So he gave all his books. I think about 4,500 books to the National Library of Wales. And they're still there. They've been very well looked after. So his entire collection, his personal library, was donated to the National Library of Wales. He felt that Wales was where he would end his days. And he kept goats. He used to milk his goats every day. He had a goat called Esmeralda, I remember that. And back in Oxford, you see, I think you can also become familiar with somebody if you know the places they really like to go to, you know. I mean, just yesterday I went to this wonderful Buddhist nunnery in um, Diamond Hill called, you know, the Zhilian, Zhilian, Qingyuan. And um, if I was to live in Hong Kong, I think I would probably go there every week because it's such a wonderful place. And it's in the middle of you know, a very busy urban area, and yet it has an extraordinary quality of tranquility. And I think if someone was to observe that I went there every week, they'd probably learn something about me, about what I needed, about where I wanted to be. Now, this church in Oxford, I mean, David was not a Christian. In fact, he was very much not a Christian. He was against religion on principle. He thought it was a very bad influence on the world. And he wrote a book about that. But um, he did, this church had a very special place in his life. It was a, a short walk from his house. And it's one of the most beautifully unchanged, unspoilt examples of early Romanesque architecture in the whole of England. It's called Ifley Church. And even today, if I go there, I find myself thinking of, of David, because it was one of his very favorite places. He would go for a walk about half an hour down the River Thames and arrive at Ifley Church. Now, amongst his he had a very wide circle of friends, as I say. One of his close friends was somebody called Michael Sullivan, who was a, a very distinguished historian of Chinese art. And David was very interested in Chinese art. And I remember on his 80th birthday, when he had a party at his house, one of the guests, it was a small circle of people, about 25 people, one of the guests was Michael Sullivan, who has passed away a few years ago. So David enjoyed being in his company, but didn't really enjoy being with the normal kind of academics. Another of his great friends was somebody called Robin Zayner, who was the professor of Oriental religions and also a fellow of all souls. And David actually dedicated the second volume of the story of the stone to his friend, Robin Zayner. He just put his initials. And Robin Zayner was interested in the history of, of mysticism in both East and West. And he and David used to have very long conversations about um, the nature of, of religious experience and the nature of, especially what, what Robin called the mystical experience. You see, this book of Robin's is called Drugs, Mysticism, and Make-Believe. And Robin Zayner was very, was very opposed to the kind of 1960s and 70s hippie experimentation with drugs. 
and the claim that you could use drugs to reach a mystical state of mind. Because he himself was a Roman Catholic, and he'd only ever had one mystical experience in his life. And he couldn't, he couldn't bear the thought that all these young people were going around taking drugs and having mystical experiences every day. He thought it was very unfair, and he wrote several books on the subject. But he and David were very good friends, because David was always interested in that kind of discussion. His other great friend, Freddie, Freddie was a notorious character in Oxford who always had his hair like that, and was always famous for swimming naked in the river. And he was a professor of Arabic, a very, very great scholar, and a real eccentric, a real, a typical Oxford eccentric. He was one of David's real friends. And when David went to Harvard, he made some very good friends as well. He spent a year in Harvard in 1958, and one of, his, one of his close friends about whom he often spoke was Achilles Fang. And uh, Achilles Fang, who was actually Korean, but insisted on pretending until his dying day that he was Chinese. He wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't Chinese at all. But he was, of course, famous for his connection with Ezra Pound. And a wonderful, again, creative, creative scholar and translator. And, you know, David made some very good friends at Harvard. Um, one of them was Achilles Fang. Another one was Glenn Baxter, who was a great authority on, on the poetry. He also had a lot of friends in France. You know, David spoke fluent French, and he was very at home in France. One of his great friends was Paul Demierville, who was a really great, again, creative scholar who translated poetry, and um, a wonderful man. David often spoke very fondly of Paul Demierville, and he often used he told me the same story many times about Paul Demierville. They were talking in Paris, and Demierville said to David, um, I remember, I'm going to do a fake French accent, sorry, I, I won't do that. I remember when I first read Hong Lo Mong. He said it was in, in Vietnam, so probably before the war. I was reading it at the French center there, the Ecole Extreme d'Extreme Orient in Hanoi, and I was lying in a hammock in the balcony, on the balcony, and there was a monkey up in, up in the roof. And he started, as I was reading Hong Lam Mung, the monkey started to pee all over me. <laughs> That's how I remember Hong Lam Mung. And David obviously liked that story because I remember him telling it at least four or five times. And whenever I see the name Paul de Neville, I think of the peeing monkey. <laughs> and his other great French friend was someone called Jacques Gernet, a very, very, very serious scholar of Chinese philosophy and history. But of all his French friends, this was the man he liked the most. And Jacques Pampano is still alive today. And I mention him because he's a very close friend of mine too. I saw him in Paris last year. He, he's still chain smoking now. He smokes 80 cigarettes a day. Uh, Jacques is one of these, again, a creative scholar. He studied Chinese literature, Chinese theater, and he's, he's a great teacher of Chinese at the, um, at the school of, of the what called Langues Orientales Vivantes in Paris. But his real joy was to, to perform with puppets. He's the great authority on Chinese puppets, and he can perform endless numbers of plays with puppets that he personally owns. And he was, he was a very close friend of David's. Now, this is David in Oxford in the days when he was translating Hong Lo Mung. That's his study, where I used to sit every week with him. And he, he gradually collected all of the texts of Hong Lo Mung with, as the years went by, as they made facsimile copies of the Zhiyan Jai um, editions. David acquired them one by one. And as he, as he progressed with his translation, he consulted these texts more and more often. And sometimes he'd just choose a text that was based on some rare edition without even telling anybody. So it was quite hard to follow him. But he believed that one should use texts if they helped you to make a better translation, not because of some textual scholarship. So he used scholarship for creative purposes. That's one of my favorite photographs of him outside the wall of my house in France, where he loved to come. And he would always sit down in a, the same chair and read a book. Uh, 
and he, he loved coming there so much. He must have come at least, at least a dozen times to stay there. And I like that photograph very much. It's one of the very rare photographs where he looks happy, because he was not a very happy man. Now, um, this is where I need to play a little bit of music. Um, uh, I think we need to play some music. Who is the person who's... Oh, here we are. I see someone coming from the left. I need to play number four, please. Number four. Thank you so much. Brilliant. And that, that piece of music is a, a wonderful piece of music written by Gabriel Fauré, the French composer, for, for piano for hands, for piano duet. And almost every time we were together, David and I would play it. He was, a, he was an amateur pianist, but he loved crashing his way through things and playing lots and lots of wrong notes and swearing and cursing. Oh, damn, oh, bugger, you know. And I kept going because I am also an amateur pianist, but slightly better than him. So m my job was to keep going from beginning to end while he sort of came in and out, missing out half the notes and getting most of them wrong. But he loved it, you know. So we played this every time. Uh, even at the last year of his life, we played the, the Dolly Suite. But when he was not playing piano duets with me, he would just play the recorder. And there he is, again, in my house in France, playing the recorder. This is one of the least happy pictures of him. I mean, he's looking quite haunted and melancholic. But I wanted to show it because this was a place that in, in the last summer of his life, in 2009, my wife, his daughter, Rachel, and I, we took him and his wife, Jean, on a holiday, which we planned for months. I mean, it was about three weeks. And we took them, first of all, to visit a very famous old manor house outside Oxford called Kelmscott. And they always liked to go there. They'd been there many times. And as I said, you can sometimes know something about people from the places they choose to go to, often. And this was one such place. Now, maybe most of you have never heard of Kelmscott, but it's a very, a very special place. This is a, a, a better photograph of the actual manor house. Now, of course, it's a pretty manor house, but it's not because of that that David went there. It's right on the, on the banks of the River Thames. He went there because this was a house that was owned and decorated and lived in by um, this man. Sorry, it's a terrible photograph. I'm very bad at putting these things. But I mean, you can only see his nose, more or less. This is William Morris. Now, William Morris, again, you see, fitted in with David's worldview because William Morris was a socialist, one of the great late 19th century socialists who also believed that things of everyday life should be beautiful. Chairs, tables, um, bedspreads, curtains, carpets. Everything should be beautiful and should be handmade and should be made with love. And so if you walk around Kelmscott Manor, where he lived with his wife Jane and other members of his, of his circle, you find everything, every single object in the house. Every door is carved. Every, every curtain is made with fabric designed by William Morris. There's one of his beautiful fabrics that he printed himself. Um, and he lived, he lived in Kelmscott Manor, and so did many of his circle. They called themselves the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And they were, this, this connects also with my theme of the, of the you know, um, the academy, the Whitewater Academy. This was a grouping together of like-minded friends who, had the who shared the same ideals and who lived together and created literature and art 
because they believed in them. They believed in creating things of true beauty, and they formed the community, and William Morris was the great leading inspiration of that movement. He also provided all the money. Um, and they had a printing press called the Kelmscott Press, which produced beautiful books. Anyway, that was Kelmscott. So to continue the theme of David's friends, in Hong Kong, he had a small number of very special friends, and one of them needs no introduction here. That's a man called Rao Tsung Yi. Rao Tsung Yi was David's friend right from the 1960s. And um, they corresponded all the time. And I remember once when I was in Hong Kong in 1995, going out to lunch with David and Jean and Rao Tsung Yi and his daughter, and they were they were very, very close to David. And this is actually a painting done by Rao Tsung Yi, a painting of David translating the story of the set. It's completely imaginary, of course. But you see, that's David <laughs> in his little... <laughs> I mean, Rao Tsung Yi is very good at doing this kind of painting, you know. And he wanted to do a painting of David translating Hong Lamang in a kind of typical Chinese scholar's hermitage, you see. And this painting is, still, is hanging today in Jean Hawkes's um, bungalow in her old people's home. It's the one painting she kept. And she lies, it's, it's, it's opposite her on the wall. So she lies in her bed and she looks at this painting because it's, it's very beautiful. It's a very long scroll. And Raja Nui did it specially for his friend David Hawkes. And he wrote this calligraphic inscription as well. You see, there's his famous um, Xuan Tang. That's his, his, his name. And um, so there are some of his friends. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a very strong link between David and Hong Kong is that his papers are, are now housed in Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, in the Chinese University Library. And um, I could give another two-hour lecture on that, but I'm not going to because it's getting late already. It's already nearly four. But I mean, I'm going to whiz through, literally whiz through, some of the things in that collection because some of you may not know about them. And there are, they also represent his friends because the letters in that collection are from his friends. And one of his oldest friends in China was Tian Zhongshu. He was introduced to Tian Zhongshu by Wu Shichang. So when he passed through Shanghai on his way up to, to, to Peking, he stopped off in Shanghai and visited Tian Zhongshu. And they became long-standing pen pals. And later on, when, when David's college, All Souls, invited Chen Zhongshu to come to Oxford, Chen Zhongshu wrote the most remarkable letter declining the invitation in flowery classical Chinese with about 50 classical allusions, you know, the kind of thing Chen Zhongshu would do. And this is the beginning of the letter. It's addressed to Ke Si Xian Chuan. You see, Huo Ke Si. It's addressed to David, basically saying, I can't accept the invitation. And David then had to translate this letter for the head of all souls, for John Sparrow. And he did it with his tongue in his cheek. And this is his translation. Um, and it's got footnotes, you see. He's, he's <laughs> he, actually, he actually wrote footnotes. But, but you know, there's actually humor to the footnote, because what he's trying to say is this letter is really showing off, because Mr. Chen always shows off, you see. <laughs> and that letter, the original of that letter and of the typescript of the translation is in the Hawks papers at China. It's, it's a priceless document of the, of the communication between these two outstanding people. Complete with footnotes. And there's Wu Shichang again. And in the papers, there are lots of letters from Wu Shichang. And a wonderful postcard from Venice sent, w in which he writes a poem, you see. Um, a seven, seven, seven characters of a line poem sent from Venice. That's in the Hawks papers, too. Again, that tells us something very special about the relationship between these two people. And this was. This was somebody very special in David's life. He was a teacher at Hong Kong University called Wang Su Kit. And he had been a student of Rao Tsung Yi's. And Rao Tsung Yi recommended him to David. So Wang Su Kit went to Oxford to do his PhD. That was the kind of international um, brotherhood of kindred spirits that existed. And Su Kit was, was one of David's absolute favorite students. <laughs> 
and a wonderful person who really kept the flag flying here in Hong Kong in terms of translation for several decades. Here's one of Rao Tsung Yu's letters. This is another of David's great friends in Hong Kong, the lady painter, Fang Zhao Lin. You know, her daughter is Anson Chan, you know, more famous for her role in the public service here. But this is Fang Zhao Lin. And she sent David endless letters and claimed to be his student. David said she only ever spent half an hour with him, but she always claimed to be his student. Anyway, this is her kind of letter, you see. She always addressed both David and his wife. So she, she called Jean uh, Furen. Yeah. Hawk of Sir. He never liked the use of this Sir. He preferred it the Sisyang, the Sir. But anyway, Hawk of Sir, Jiao Shou, Furen, etc., etc. Another of his great friends was Liu Cunren, Liu Cunyan, who wrote him endless letters as well and did the inscription for his, for his 80th birthday book. And then there were lots of scholars in the mainland that he corresponded with. This famous, famous Hong Lamong scholar called, um, called Dong Yunxiang. This is one of his letters in the papers. Achilles Fang and wonderful Yang Zhou Han, who was a great friend of David's from Oxford days. That's Yang Zhou Han. I remember him very well. And Glenn Baxter from Harvard. And the novelist Vikram Seth. He was a great friend of David's. David enjoyed the company of creative writers, artists, musicians, very similar in a way to Arthur Whaley, whom he revered. In fact, David worshipped the Bloomsbury world. This is a one of the many letters from Vikram Seth. Vikram Seth wrote a very famous novel called A Suitable Boy. And once at a public reading, he was asked at the end of the, of the reading, which which work of literature most influenced you and most inspired you to write your huge novel, A Suitable Boy? And without a moment's hesitation, he said, The Story of the Stone, because he was very influenced by it. And this is um, an interesting relationship. I think this is time for another piece of music, please. Um, and w wait one minute. Um, one minute. Uh, sorry. I'm trying. I, I'm experimenting today with using music. I've never used it before, but I'm really very happy with it. Um, you see, David loved music very, very much. He always listened to music. And his favorite composer was Gustav Mahler, the great um, turn of the century Viennese um, master. And um, in the course of, of his later years, he corresponded with the biographer of Gustav Mahler called Donald Mitchell, and there were long letters exchanged between them because one of Mahler's great works is called Das Lied von der Erde, The Song of the Earth, which uses um, some rather unusual um, translations of Chinese poetry. And Donald Mitchell was very keen to get to the bottom of them, so he wrote to David, and read, David wrote back long letters um, about the origins of the poems and so on. He took enormous trouble to help to help, um, to help um, Donald Mitchell with, with his work on Gustav Mahler's Das Lied von der Erde. And I, I want to play you a little bit of this because I played it at the very beginning. It's the most extraordinary recording, which I chose very carefully because it's got the great British um, singer Kathleen Ferrier, and it's one of the last performances she gave before she died. She died of very young of breast cancer. And the conductor is Bruno Walter, of course, the great inheritor of the Viennese tradition. And Bruno Walter, the conductor on this brief extract, once said, it has been my great privilege in life to perform with two great musicians, two, Kathleen Ferrier and Gustav Mahler, in that order. In other words, he said Kathleen Ferrier was more important to him than Gustav Mahler. And her voice is just extraordinary. And what we're going to listen to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to inflict it on you yet again. It's the last bars of Das Lied von der Erde, where the words, it ends with the word ewig, which means forever, eternal. And this is one of the most extraordinary pieces of music ever written, the very last bars. Yes, can we listen to that now? Can you have it a little bit less loud? It was rather too loud last time. The volume was a bit too loud. I'm going to go and sit down because I don't think I can stand on stage listen to this. I could be. 
he liked Mahler because he found Mahler reflected his own rather, um, well, angst-ridden state of mind. Uh, sorry, I'm, did I tell you which one it was? It's number one. There are several reasons why I wanted to play that. One is simply it's the most sublime piece of music and a sublime performance, but also because, you see, it is based on a Chinese poem. And if, if ever I want to think of an example of Chinese literature reaching into the very heart of Western culture, I, I turn to this because it's one of the greatest works in the whole of Western music inspired by Chinese poetry, you see. It wouldn't have been possible without those translations. However strangely changed they were, they were what inspired Gustav Mahler to write what I personally think is one of his greatest works. The other reason that I chose it is because you, you get to know somebody by knowing their friends, you get to know them by knowing where they go when they want to be alone, but also you can get to know them by knowing what their favorite music is. And, um, you know, I think it's a very quick way of getting to know somebody to say, what's your favorite music, you know? And if it's like the Sex Pistols, you know it's the Sex Pistols, you know? And you know that that's what their favorite music is. And if it's Keith Jarrett, you know it's Keith Jarrett, and so on. And in the case of David, when I first got to know him, he was a big Mahler fan, you know? He just listened to Mahler, Mahler, Mahler. And so was my father, interestingly enough. And at the time, when, when I got to know David first, I was, a, I was not a big Mahler fan at all. My favorite composer was Bruckner. And I kept saying to David, you really ought to listen to Bruckner, you know. And no, no, he said that he was Hitler's favorite composer. I don't want to listen to that. So I took, he took a lot of convincing until finally I said to him, you've got to listen to Bruckner, David. Come on, let's sit down and listen to the Eighth Symphony, right? Which is my favorite Bruckner symphony. I was very, very mad about Bruckner in those days. And eventually he listened to Bruckner and he said, John, how marvelous. He wrote me a letter about it. Thank you, thank you for introducing me to Bruckner. And many years later, he wanted to buy a birthday present for his wife. And he went to the CD shop with me to choose a recording of Bruckner's Eighth Symphony. And I helped him choose a good recording. And he said that became one of my favorite things. So I use that 
because it's a kind of insight into, into our friendship as well, you know. We, we, we were friends through literature, but we were also friends through many other things, and through music especially, you know. And music, music is a very important part of my life today, and it was a very important part of his life. So if you're, I don't think I will play the Bruckner because we're really running out of time, and I, I, I must try not to be too self-indulgent. I could listen to Bruckner's Eighth Symphony. Oh, go on, let's listen to a short bit, okay. <laughs> I'm being so totally insincere. Of course I want to listen to Bruckner. This is Bruckner's Eighth Symphony, the very opening bars. I mean, it's like looking at the beginning of the world, you know, just those opening bars where it comes in. I mean, I, I won't, I, I mean, I should let Leo talk about Bruckner, but I mean, or, or Louis, because I'm just an amateur, but it's number two, I think. Here we are, it's conducted by Gunther Van. like listening to the dawning of the world. It's a very long. I, I would very happily sit here and listen to the whole thing, but then I think I would become very unpopular. It's, it's, it's um, you see, it's a very, Bruckner was very different from Mahler. I mean, he wasn't, he was a very religious person. He was constantly, you know, he would improvise on the organ and it would go on for hours, you know, because he just was in raptures. It was like praying to God, you know. He was a very strange man indeed. And um, I might even have a picture of very hard to find a nice picture of Bruckner because <laughs> he looks so odd. <laughs> That's Bruckner, right? And a very strange man, but the most sublime composer who contrasts very strongly with Mahler. You know. Mahler was this introspective, tortured soul, you know, who was constantly <coughs> struggling with the existential angst and so on. And Bruckner was just this, this pilgrim on his way to the heavenly vision, you know, all the time. And uh, so, you know, I was. I didn't give, give David a great deal. I mean, he mostly gave stuff to me in the course of our long friendship and so on. But one of the few things that I feel I'm glad I was able to share with him was the music of Anton Bruckner. And he went on to, to become a great Bruckner um, devotee. The, the other thing I shared with him, which he had never discovered before, which became one of his favorites, was the work of George MacDonald. George MacDonald. Oh, sorry, I'm hiding the microphone behind my back. George MacDonald was, was an extraordinarily late Victorian visionary writer of fantasy novels, such as Lilith, and a, a wonderful short visionary novel called The Golden Key. And I had learnt about him from friends during the 60s and 70s, because he was a bit of a cult writer for that period. And then I introduced those works to David, and he was... He wrote to me letters expressing his incredible gratitude for having encountered a new writer. Because for him, literature was part of his life, you know. He read all the other people. I read George MacDonald, and I shared it with him. I'm afraid the order is a little bit random. These are some more of his friends who are represented in the papers. Burton Watson was a very close friend of David's. And there are many letters from him in the papers. And so was Robert Hightower from Harvard, very close friend. Also a translator of Chinese poetry, very different from David, much more scholarly, much less sort of um, creative, but a fine scholar. And this is one of his letters. This is the last letter he ever wrote. He was already dying when he wrote that letter. That's another of his friends. And one of the friends that he made during the 80s, actually, he didn't know him until the very late, was Yang Xianyi. And this, this rather bad black and white reproduction is of a photograph taken when Yang Xianyi went to visit David in his house in Wales. They immediately became close friends. They were so happy to have met each other at last. Also, as part of the papers, is the corrected first edition of his Songs of the South, Chu Tzu. 
with his handwritten. It's very interesting to look at the way, I'm always fascinated by the way translators revise and um, constantly work on their, their translations, and David was no exception. He also wrote me dozens of letters, 77 of them, on, on translating the story of the stone. They are not yet in the papers, because I still have them in my possession, and I treasure them. But one day I shall donate them to the library, because there's so much to be learned from what he wrote to me in these letters. And then the last document, really, is this extraordinary notebook, series of notebooks, which have been reproduced, um, very beautifully reproduced by by um, Lingnan University. And I'm just going to whiz through these because I just don't have time to talk about them. But these notebooks were notebooks kept by David as he was translating Hong Lo Meng. And um, they're fascinating reading. For a start, look at his beautiful handwriting, his beautiful Chinese handwriting. A lot of people who look at these notebooks cannot believe that this was a foreigner writing Chinese because he had such a, such a beautiful hand. He used, to, he used to practice writing, you know, calligraphy and writing Chinese again and again and again. Again, he had eternal patience. And this is his, these are from his notebooks. He drew, he drew maps. These are fascinating. When he was translating Hong Lamang, he would draw maps because he wanted to know where everybody was, you know. He w when when Cao Xiuqin said, and so she walked through Wang Shifeng's apartment to go back to see Jiao Mu, and as she passed the such and such a door, he wanted to know, you know, what the geography was. He didn't want to write meaningless, you know, theoretical treatises. He wanted to know the facts. So there are lots of these wonderful maps. And then when doing the poetry, he just wrote it all out. Um, we're coming now to closely, close to the end. I'm sorry, I've overrun, but I, I, I have to finish. I can't stop this one because it's got its own trajectory. Um, during the last years of his life, David started to read Chinese all over again. And he wrote to me and said, would you send me some modern Chinese writing? I'd like to keep my hand in. So I sent him books from Hong Kong. And I sent him s some works by Bai Xianyong. He'd never heard of Bai Xianyong, you see. And he was absolutely carried away by Bai Xianyong's writing. He wrote to me and said, why have I never discovered this person before? He writes so beautifully. He's wonderful. And then he met Bai Xianyong in London when they performed Mu Dan Ting. And he was delighted by this wonderful person. He also was involved in the last years of his life in helping a young exiled Chinese poet called Liu Hongbin to get his work published and wrote a long introduction just by way of helping him. He wasn't a great poet or anything, but um, David wanted to give him a helping hand. And his last ever publication in 2008, he went back to the subject of William Empson and wrote a long article for the Times Literary Supplement all about one of Empson's poems, which he called A Chinese Ballad. I'm going to end now by referring to a very, a very special time, which was the summer of 2009, when my wife and I went back to England to take David on a holiday with his wife. And um, we had no idea that he was about to die, because so often you don't know. But I mean, he actually died in, on July the 31st. And this would have been early in July. We took him to a very beautiful part of Sussex, the Sussex countryside in southern England. And we rented a small cottage and took him out, took them out every day on little excursions. And they were very happy. And we went to Glyndebourne Opera House. And there's a picture of, he, he insisted on hiring the absolute best kind of clothes, you know, and dressing up in, you know, proper black tie and everything, even though he was very, very unwell and in considerable pain. And that's, that's um, his daughter, Rachel, my wife, walking with him in the grounds of Glyndebourne Opera House. We went to see an opera which, which we'd never seen before by Dvorak called Rusalka, which is the most extraordinary opera involving a young girl mostly lying on the ground singing, uh, singing on her back. <laughs> 
and that was quite an experience, but we enjoyed it. That was not the production we saw, but that's a scene from Rosalka. It's very famous for an aria about the moon. We also went to a, a reading in Lewis Town Hall about the great activist Thomas Paine, and the reading was actually given by um, an interesting man called John Calder, who's a publisher, who goes back to the 30s and 40s. There he is with William Burroughs, and Calder was still alive, and he gave the talk, and David was just fascinated because it was part of his tradition, you know. And Thomas Paine was a man after his own heart, you know, an angry, protesting activist, you see. That's what David was too. But he was also a profoundly melancholic person. I chose this painting by Edvard Munch because as I wrote in, in his obituary in the Times, which I gave you in the handout, David was both inspired by and seriously hindered by a lifelong depression. I mean, some days he would walk down to his study. I know this because he would tell me. And he would sit down and stare at the Chinese text of Hong Lamang, and he wouldn't understand a single word. And he would just sit there in complete silence for the whole morning until eventually he just, you know, braced himself and went out for a walk or something. But he suffered from crippling depression, I mean, truly crippling depression. And uh, he, he surmounted it to produce two wonderful works, The Songs of the South and The Story of the Stone. And in a way, it was an inseparable part of his being, but it was something he had to fight against all his life. And I think it's very important to recognize these these factors in someone's life. He struggled with depression for his whole life. Now, in his last, uh, this is the last piece of music. Um, this is number three in, in one second. Oh, dear. I, I have to master this musical thing. This is my first experiment. But in his last days, when he was staying in this cottage, we would say to him, David, what would you like to do? One of the things he asked for, and of course, looking back on it, we realize now that he knew he was dying because he knew, but he wouldn't tell anybody. He was suffering from the last stages of, of, of cancer of the pancreas, but he was keeping it to himself because he didn't want everybody else to be dragged along. And the other thing he said was, I'd like to go to a beech forest. And of course, the great beech forests of England are really inspiring places. So we managed to find one for him. And this is, this is the kind of, it's not the same one, this is just a photo off the internet, but this is a typical English beach forest. It's superb and so quintessentially English. And, uh, and then literally three weeks after this, he, he, was, he suddenly couldn't uh, um, cope anymore. He was taken to hospital and he died a week later. Um, now, I had the enormous privilege of knowing him for some um, just under 40 years and I had the great um, joy of beginning as his student and then becoming his collaborator and then becoming his friend and then becoming his father-in-law. So I feel deeply responsible um, to keep reminding people of what kind of a person he was and today I've tried using the, the materials I've been able to collect, I've tried to recreate for you some picture of this remarkable man. Thank you very much.
Professor Moonfall, I have a very, I have a quick question. Yesterday you mentioned uh, Mr. Hawks and you used uh, Pinyin, uh, French, and Latin to translate the different characters' names in uh, Hong Long Mo. So I am wondering why you used why uh, Mr. Hawks and you used Pinyin to translate the main characters' names. Thank you. Well, of course, I did talk yesterday about Pinyin and Wei Giles. Originally, David used Wei Giles, but he wanted to he wanted to help the reader to differentiate between the different levels of people, so he chose to give the real sound of the names to the to the sort of um, the fan, the rich, the wealthy family, and those upper class people. So, I mean, he could have used some other method, but. He chose to use he chose to use Romanization for them as a way of setting them apart, and then he chose French for what he would call the low life characters, the actors, the sing song girls, and people like that. Yes, I don't think it's I don't think it's a lot more complicated than what I said yesterday. I mean, there's no particular significance in his choice of Pinyin. I mean, he might as well have done something else, but he just thought Romanization was the way to go for the, for the upper classes. Hmm. John, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture and, and so that we could have a glimpse of the, you know, the great tra translator was like and how his life shaped the translation. It was very interesting to know that uh, uh, David Cox to work at the uh, court breaking office before he even attempted any translation. Now, uh, do you think that uh, the fact that he worked there had any kind of influence on him, or, or would you th say the translation is a kind of a code-breaking um, uh, effort, or uh, well, do you some, someone want to say that you know, translating is code-breaking? What would you say? Well, Gilbert, that's a brilliant question, and um, my answer is going to be a huge disappointment to you, I'm afraid. He wasn't really a code breaker. He taught Japanese to code breakers, right? He wasn't like that character in Enigma, you know? I mean, but he would have been a brilliant code breaker, there's no doubt about it, but he never was. So, although I agree with you that maybe code breakers would be great, would be great translators, <laughs> he is not a good example because he was never actually a code breaker himself. Um, he just um, translated Japanese. Well, first of all, no, he taught Japanese to code breakers so that they could break codes, right? So he was always a language teacher, really, not a code breaker. So I'm sorry to disappoint you, but because it could have been a brilliant theory, but I mean, it's unfortunately <laughs> not, not based in any form of fact. <laughs> but but, do you, but uh, what do you think uh, of yourself being a code breaker, if you were to go and do it, you think you could you could do it very well? I think, I think that, yeah, I think there's something there. I think that a lot of translation is code breaking, of course. But you're not just, I mean, code breaking, you break the code and then you hand over the results to the military, you know, and they, 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 they bomb a city or whatever it is. Whereas translation, you actually use a, the breaking of a code to create a thing of beauty. So I think there is a fundamental difference, you know. And um, I don't think, but I think that there's certainly a, because translation is composed of two elements. One is analysis, and the other is synthesis. You know, you analyze, you break down the code, you try to get to the meaning, the deeper meaning, and so on. But then you have to re-synthesize it. That's recasting it, you see. So you melt down the metal, and then you pour it into a new vessel. Now, the code breakers are just basically melting metal all the time, you know. They never get to recast. They never get to remake. If they did, they'd be sacked, you know. If, if, if a code breaker came to you and said, I've broken the Japanese code, and I've written a wonderful poem about it, you know. <laughs> they'd just say, go and get another job, you know, because that's not your job. Your job is just to crack the code. So, um, but, you know, it's an interesting thought, yes. There's certainly something there, Gilbert, I think. I think there's so a very so there, you know, so there uh, goes my brilliant theory, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for Thanks, your answer. Thanks, Okay, uh, thank you very, very much, Professor Minford. Shall we give another big round of applause to Professor Minford?
And once again, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to Hang Seng Management College. We thoroughly enjoyed your company. We hope to see you around very soon. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you.